This con this conference will now be recorded. I double clicked. Okay, well, good morning. My name is Carmen and this is our tutor training. Um, Lindsay is actually one of our interns, Sonia, so she's a little bit more familiar with seeds. If you have any questions at any point, feel free to just jump in and ask since it's just you in the session this morning, okay? Okay. Um, so, um, so normally we do just quick introductions. Do you want to tell us what made you decide to become a tutor at Seeds? Um, so I uh, am going to be majoring in social work in the f like starting in the fall. Uh, and I need to get some volunteering hours in. Um, I was looking around for opportunities um basically like close to home but now it's even closer to home because <laughs> it's all online um and i i saw seeds and i thought it would be really cool to help somebody else out um with school because you know i'm i'm good with school so you know something something that i can do i feel like all right lindsay do you want to tell how you ended up at seeds um, I actually went to, it was like a volunteer fair at Case Western, um, mm -hmm. and I found out a seat about SEEDS through there. I saw they had internship opportunities, and I also attended a tutor training before COVID, but now I'm attending this one just to see how it's changed. But, okay, yeah. so, <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit today about what literacy is and why it's important. We'll talk about how SEEDS addresses the challenges of adult learners, how we've pivoted to address those needs during the pandemic, and talk a little bit more about just understanding adult literacy students in general. So um, the, the training that Lindsay went to in the fall was a six hour training. Um, we've made this a much, much condensed training at this point because we're all doing everything online. The bad news, even after the six hour training, is that you're not going to leave training knowing exactly what to do. You're not going to have all of your questions answered. But the good news is that we do have a great supporting cast of characters who will help support you. Um, our students' first interaction with Seeds of Literacy when they come on site is with our student engagement coordinator uh, who does orientation and does retention. So we also follow up with students once they've been in the program to make sure that things are going okay. Um, every, we have a very loose program so students can come when they want, but if we don't see them after a week or two, we call, we reach out to them to make sure that everything's okay to see if there's anything we can do to help remove barriers so that they can continue working on their education. Um, right now, I'm kind of filling the role of student engagement because we have a reduced staff since the pandemic. Um, one of our board, our board was concerned that our funders would probably pivot to focus on COVID relief efforts, and they have, and rightfully so. So we knew that our funding um, would not support having the, the whole big staff that we have. So I'm actually doing the student engagement coordinator role right now and kind of splitting it with two other staffers at the moment. We're all wearing multiple hats at the moment. Uh, we have a site coordinator at each site. Our two sites are West 25th and Clark and our east side site is the east 139th and Kinsman. We have a site coordinator at each site, and those are the people that you're gonna have the most interaction with as a tutor. So when you come into the classroom at Seeds of Literacy for your first teaching session, um, the, the site coordinators will pair you with the student based on what your interests are and based on what the student's needs are. And then typically what ends up happening is you kind of start, you know, you form a relationship with the student if you're if you and the student attend around the same time you typically end up working with the same student but if you attend at different days and different times you may be paired with different students but the site coordinators are the ones who will help help match you they'll help the students make sure that they have the correct work that they're working on they'll make sure that the students are being assessed and they'll um, just kind of help manage that that whole transaction we also have two digital literacy coordinators their roles are actually going to be shifting a little bit um, because we are going to maintain our online learning even after we return to our physical location. Um, so, but our digital literacy coordinators roles are to help support students in developing the skills that will help them in college and career related to technology. And then we have an administrative that supports all of that and we all work to support our tutors. So you're never at a loss, even if you come out not knowing everything, still having questions, there are lots of folks who can who can help support you, guide and direct you through that. Um, if you've been on our website, then you've probably already seen the statistic. What we typically ask people in our 
trainings if they can guess what percentage of Cleveland residents are considered functionally illiterate. Do you have a guess for that? Lindsay, um, you know, so don't say anything. <laughs> I feel like I, I've seen it, but I, I think it's right. Is it like 30? Um, it's actually 66. Wow. Um, that is and I saw your eyebrows shoot up. So that was marvelous, that reaction. <laughs> <laughs> So, and actually it's higher in some areas and actually the two communities where our program is located, the rates are closer to 70-ish percent on the west side and 90 something percent on the east side. Um, and functionally illiterate is it's the term, I think I hear people in the community use it very, very incorrectly. So I'm gonna just define it for you pretty quickly. But um, when we are, when we go about the tasks of everyday life, we're pretty certain that we're making the right decisions based on the information that we receive from written written information. So you can read a bus schedule or you can read a prescription or you can read discharge papers from the hospital and be fairly certain that you're following the directions that the doctor had for you. You're fairly certain that you'll get to your destination on time because you have a good solid foundation of, of education. So for someone to be functionally illiterate, it means that their foundation isn't solid that there may be gaps in what information they're able to, to get from, from written print information, numerical and alphanumeric, or alphabetical rather. Um, and so they're, they're, they struggle. So we may have students who um, are raising families, they may have jobs, they may have businesses, but they struggle with reading. Um, as my family was talking this weekend about a family member who is in his 70s and he's learning to read and he's really excited about learning to read but he's worked my entire life and honestly if something happened to your car you would have no knowledge that he was not a reader because his skill level in, in mechanics auto mechanics are very high so they're they're able to function they're able to work they're able to produce they're able to do what they need to do for their families but they just don't have that foundation and so what happens is sometimes they make may make incorrect conclusions or they may you know, misdiagnose or or um, take the wrong dosages of medicine because they're not able to get accurate information. Or maybe they're able to be swindled easily by bad loan agreements because they don't know how to read all the terms and obtain that information. So <laughs> our students are anywhere from 18 to 80. We take anyone um, for the most part, if they, can, if, if they can't read at all, we help them. Um, we are one of the only programs uh, in the state possibly even in a country that'll take a student who cannot read at all and help them through, help an adult learner um, gain those reading skills. So um, a lot of our students are also single parents. 65% of our students can't pass the basic digital literacy assessment that we administer in the beginning. Um, a lot of our students come to us, they've never used a computer before. They don't know how to use a mouse. They don't know what things are called. Um, we had a student who, who would call the cursor when he would see it on the screen. He'd go, well, where's my little bug? Where's the little bug? <laughs> so <they're, laughs> we're helping them to develop the skills that will help them be successful in the many roles that adult liter literacy learners fill, parents, spouses, caregivers, workers, business owners, whatever. We try to support that. And then 84% of our students live below the poverty level. So one of the things that we say in our orientation is uh, we, we use the term, even with our staff, don't should on our students. And that's a term actually from Narcotics Anonymous that someone shared that we liked. Um, but basically that means that our students' lives are very different from our own. So it really is, is not appropriate for us to tell them what they should do in their situation since we've never walked in their shoes. So we try to say, we try to make suggestions in terms of like, well, have you tried this? Or do you think this would help? Or are you familiar with this resource? Or, you know, instead of saying, um, you know, what it is that they should do. Um, and we, we actually added that to the slide because of some incidents that happened between tutors, students and tutors in the classroom where tutors are really trying to be helpful, but it just didn't come across as helpful to the student because it was like, you know, your reality is very different than mine. Um, so people look at that statistic and they're really, really shocked by it. And one of the first questions that people ask is how do you get to be 70 years old? Or how do you get to be 35 years old if you can't read? Well, there are lots of reasons for that. A lot of those reasons are related to home and a lot of them are related to school. So in terms of home factors, um, exposure is huge. If, if a student is not exposed to a lot of things that are in, the, in our um, middle class curriculum in their experience, then they're not going to have that knowledge. So they basically have to learn 
uh, more to understand the culture of the school as it differs from the culture from their home. And I can use an experience from my own life in this. Um, I think about, um, I remember very clearly having a, uh, having an, an assignment. I think I was in, I think I was in second grade in Ms. Conway's class. And we had to, you know, we were drawing pictures of, of the different, you know, spelling words and things. And one of them was a den. And I didn't know what a den was, you know, like in my experience, a den was where Daniel met the lion. So I just drew like a dark hole with a little lion <laughs> inside of it. You know, no, I didn't know that a den was a part of a house because it just wasn't, I wasn't, hadn't been exposed to that, you know. Um, so, so there's, ex there's that kind of exposure. Um, and then there's just, uh, we are, we learn language orally. We learn it from what we hear. So if I learn language incorrectly uh, for five years, when I get to school, that's, there's like a mismatch there. So if I hear X, let me ask you something at home. When I get to school and see ASK, I'm not going to automatically make that shift in my, in my, in how I've been pronouncing this word for five or six years. So there, there's a lot of that too. And then there's, if you have instability in your home, we're, we're hearing a lot now about trauma and the role of trauma. Um, I teach part-time at Cleveland State, and my students read a book this year called Do I, Do I Dare Disturb the Universe by Charlize Lyles. And she's a woman who grew up in Cleveland in the central neighborhood, um, lived in the housing projects, and just kind of experienced a lot of stuff as a little girl. And she described how when she was younger, she there was so much trauma in her life, instability, moving from moving uh, different neighborhoods and then having to change schools and, you know, her brother being arrested, seeing someone murdered, how when that kind of trauma came back to her mind while she was in school, she would daydream to, to push it away. And because she daydreamed, she wasn't keeping up with what the teachers were teaching. So they put her in slow classes and she was actually a gifted student who was just trying to deal with everything that goes on in her life. So there's all kinds of personal and home related factors that can impact a student's ability to learn. Um, beyond that, there is the, our culture with, where we expect everyone to have, to be a proficient reader by the time that they're eight. And we know that people learn differently and at different rates and that it's not necessarily um, that our schools aren't really set up for everyone to succeed. So on the school system side, we have the bell curve. We, we know that most when teachers know that most students are grasping something, they, they tend to kind of need to move on because they have so much that they're trying to cover over the course of a nine month year. So because of that, um, we don't really have a system in place for the students who get left behind in those lower end tails we don't really have a system in place for them to catch up. In our schools, we say that kids learn to read in, in kindergarten through grade, grades three, and that from grades four through 12, they, they read to learn. So if a student doesn't have it by third grade, there really aren't mechanisms in place to help them do that. And in teacher education, um, we teach teachers who are teaching young children how to teach reading, but we don't teach middle school and, and high school teachers to teach reading because we assume that they will have that even though we know that a large percentage of students don't. So there are things that are in our schools and in, in students' homes that contribute to that 66% statistic. Um, the other thing is just class sizes. Class sizes um, can vary in, in schools, but if you think about it, um, in preschools, you can have no more than 14 kids to one adult, and then you put kids in kindergarten class or first grade class, and there, there can be up to 30 kids in one classroom. So how is a teacher supposed to make sure that every kid gets everything when you have that that many kids in a class, um, that many diverse learners in a class? Because again, they're all coming with different exposures and experiences in their childhood. So there are lots of factors that contribute to that. What we want you to focus on is the fact that if a kid is seven years old or eight years old and they're not reading proficiently and no one intervenes, that kid did not fail. The system failed that kid. And so we try to keep that perspective in mind. We try to share that perspective with our students because a lot of them come and they bring so much emotional baggage from all of the academic failure that's been in their past. And we want them to understand that that failure wasn't their failure. That failure is a failure of the system. That failure is a failure of the adults who were in their lives who didn't intervene at the time. And that we are not gonna fail them once they come to see. That is the big idea. So because our students are very, very different, they all have very different experiences. We don't use the term dropout. We say separate. Uh, so whatever, they all separated from schools for different reasons. They all separated at different ages. Maybe some people separated when they were 14. Some may have gone till they were 16 or 17. 
Uh, they all have different reasons. They all separated at different times. And so we feel like the education that they get should be as, as unique as they are because being treated the same as every other kid in the class didn't work for them the first time. It doesn't make sense to us to replicate that. So we try to make sure that every student gets specifically what it is that they want, which is why we follow the one-to-one -one model. Um, we wouldn't be able to do the one-to-one -one model without our tutors, which is why you all being here is so very important, particularly now <laughs> during the pandemic when we really need tutors who have technological skills <laughs> because we're doing so much distance learning. It's helpful if tutors have the, you know, just the savvy and the persistence to, to troubleshoot if they run into some issues. Um, so how are we providing this one-to-one -one instruction during the pandemic? We actually have um, a couple different resources in place for students. So, so the first thing, we found out on March 13th that we were going to be closing. We sent out a mass text to all of our students to say, hey, we're closing. Please come in on Monday to get work. We were thinking we'd be closed for maybe three weeks, four weeks. Who knew? <laughs> you know? and so we wanted them to come in and pick up work, but we also didn't want our students to be at home struggling with some of their work and not having an option of, of getting support. So we quickly uh, sent an email to all of our tutors and said, you know, would you be willing to do tele-tutoring to coach students over the phone? And so we got all of the, we think we had like 56 tutors call us back and say, hey, I wanna help, how can I, how do I do this? And so what we did is we asked each tutor to create a free conference call HD line and so they all created a line and we asked them to let us know when they're available. So we created a schedule. We created a, um, a schedule of when tutors are available, what subjects they're teaching, and then how the students can access them. So mm -hmm. um, what that did is it allowed students who wanted to continue working but who didn't have access to computers to still be able to reach out and connect with a tutor if they wanted to and to be able to do it in a way where we weren't crossing any um, any boundaries. So you don't have the students' personal phone numbers, they don't have your personal phone numbers, it's just the conference call line. Um, with the conference call line, the way that they work is you call the service and you'll hear like music in the background. And then when the student joins your call, the music will stop and then you'll hear them introduce themselves. So it really kind of is a meeting of the minds. It isn't like you have to explain to the students that when you call that line, it's not gonna ring at the tutor's house. It is not a it is not a personal number. Um, and so so students are calling in and getting tutoring via tele-tutoring. Um, and we have some tutors who have like standing appointments. So say uh, Lindsay calls in every Monday and you work with Lindsay every Monday. So you may not be on the schedule anymore because we just know that that's going to happen. Um, and then other tutors on the schedule and then students, you know, we get new students every week. We've actually been doing orientation. We've we've accepted, I want to say, 70 new students since we've started, and we have about 150 who we've invited to today's orientation. So hopefully they don't all show up. <laughs> 150 is a lot to having to go to meeting. But um, so that's our tele-tutoring. Um, we also created video tutoring because we figured some of our students really do want the personal touch. They might want to see, see their tutors. And um, so what we did is we asked tutors that they would be willing to do a live video lesson. And the way the live video lessons work is a tutor will say, you know, hey, I'm really good at math. Here are four math topics that I think I can do a live lesson on. They prepare a lesson, maybe even with a PowerPoint. Um, and then they teach that lesson for about 30 minutes. And then there's time for students to ask questions. So the video lessons are actually scheduled. So you have to, for the tutoring, you just have to show up. Um, you show up on the line, the student shows up on the line. Oh, I should also say that our curriculum is digitized. So we're able to give you access to a SharePoint draft. So whatever the student is working on, you can search for and you can have that in front of you too. So you can see exactly what they're doing. Um, for the video conferences, so for the tele tutoring, you don't have to create any content on your own. We give you everything. But for the video tutoring, the tutors are actually generating the content. And so that's one session they use GoToMeeting just like this. So it works a lot very similar to how our orientation works. So that was working pretty well. And then our students started reaching out to us and saying, you know, hey, this is really cool. I'm really glad that I still get to connect with my tutors, but I, I miss my friends. I don't get to see my classmates. So we went back to the drawing board. Um, oh, let me just show you really quickly. If you decide to do, well, we actually don't need tele-tutors at the moment. We need more video tutors and table, table session tutors. But if you wanna do a, a free conference call account, 
you just enter your email address and then create a password and then they will show you on the right what your dialing number is, what your host code is, what your participant code is, and you just share that information with us and then save that information for yourself so you can go back to it. So we instituted table sessions and table sessions are meant to create um, replicate more in the classroom. So in our typical classroom, you might have a table of four and you might have two students and two tutors or one, one tutor and three students, but sometimes we have students who, are, who all, we're all working on math and we all want this one tutor, so we're willing to share one tutor. So sometimes that happens. So the table sessions are meant to replicate that somewhat. So you have one, one or two tutors who are in the session and several students may call in at one time and they're all um, at a virtual table getting their tutoring. Um, again, each student is working on their own individual work. Um, it is possible that there may be two students working on fractions at the same time, but they all have their own individual learning plan that they're following, and the tutors just kind of support them through that. And then last are the recorded lessons. So all of our live video lessons are recorded because we wanted to be able to give students flexibility to, um, you know, if they're working during the day and they miss a recorded lesson, we didn't want them to feel like, oh, well, I, gosh, you know, it just kind of, you know, all the lessons happen during the day when I'm at work and I can't access them. So we provided some during the day. So let me just pause for a moment. And are there any questions at this point? Uh, no, I don't think so. So basically everything is happening like digitally and over phone right now. Uh, and so by like, do you guys think you're going to reopen sometime soon or you guys think we that? Yeah, we're actually planning um, a gradual reopen now. Um, I don't have dates exactly, but I have phases. So the first thing that we're going to do is have the staff go back and prepare our site physically. So we are moving table, removing tables and removing chairs so that we make sure that everybody maintains the six foot distance at the tables. We are um, erecting plexiglass barriers on the table so that if you are at a table with a the student, there's something between you. Mm -hmm. um, we are um, still obtaining more um, protective equipment, masks, um, masks, uh, shields. Uh, we, my boss actually got, uh, what do you call them, gowns, <laughs> so like gloves. Um, we're getting more cleaning supplies because we clean, we clean our classroom between every class session every day anyway but we wanna be cleaning constantly, particularly the things that people are gonna be touching more. Um, we wanna go in and erect signs and direct traffic patterns, and then just prepare for the students who are coming in. So the first phase is just getting our physical site ready, cleaned, organized, ready, um, directing traffic patterns between us and the other organizations that use our space so that we don't have a, a large group of students coming in when another organization has a large group of students coming in. So just working on the logistics, that's phase one. Phase two, um, our new fiscal year begins July 1st. Every fiscal year, we reassess our students if they hadn't, haven't reassessed in the last 60 days. And we also have students update their contact information. So phase two, we'll be bringing in students for registration and reassessment because we can't do that part virtually. Um, and then we also have, as I mentioned earlier, we've um, brought in new students who have not gone through our typical orientation, so they'll be oriented in the more traditional way. And we'll do that in phases as well, because we can only have so many people in the class and still maintain the six foot social distance. And because we typically do three class sessions with as many students as show up, and now we have to limit the size of that. So we're trying to do more sessions. So we're trying to put that in place as well. Um, after we get all of our students through that, uh, that reassessment, then we'll bring students back um, for tutoring. And then again, our numbers will be affected because we can only have so many people in this space at one time. And we want to make sure that, you know, we keep our student staff and tutors all safe. Um, we are doing screenings before people come into the building. So before you can even get into the space, you have to have your temperature taken and answer questions and things like that. Um, about your your what symptoms you're experiencing and anything if you've been around anyone who's been diagnosed with the virus. So um, all of that is going to take a couple of months. So we are not anticipating being back on site before September for sure. Um, <laughs> we don't really know dates and we're watching the trend lines and seeing what's happening with the state and hoping that there isn't a second wave <laughs> um, like they're predicting. So 
makes so sense. That's, that's kind of our plan. So let me just show you really quickly. If you go to our website, the first thing you're going to see actually is, a, um, oh, well, I was on the website earlier, so you're not going to see it now. But the first thing that comes up is a window that says, hey, we're still closed because of this virus. You'll have to close that window. But if you click on this gold box here, it'll take you to all of the resources that we're offering students right now. So you can click the tutoring video lessons and recorded lessons. So if you click on the tutoring link, there are directions for how to get into the call. There's a video for how to get into the call. And then there's a schedule. Um, if you click on, say, for example, Monday, then you can see if I want to take a one to two o'clock class on Monday and I want to focus on math, I can call any of these four tutors because they all teach math. And so what I would do is I would call this number and then I would enter the access code once I'm inside the call. What we've also, we've had some students who have T-Mobile, Metro PCS or Cricket have been told that they, they'll be charged for their calls. So what we do for them is that we have them um, text the words, call me to one of these numbers and the service will call them back and then they enter the access code and then they're able to get, get into the conference for free. Uh, we also do special events at Seeds. Uh, we let in in May our special event. Our students on our east side were reading. The book club was reading Michelle Obama's Becoming, and so Netflix released a video of Michelle Obama's some of her book tour highlights and things like that. So we watched that as a group. Students and tutors and staff were all online at the same time via go to meeting, and we watched Michelle Obama's Becoming. In June, um, our special event is with Captain Courtney Schult. Courtney is. Courtney is a GED grad, but she is definitely a champion for SEED. So she got her GED. Uh, she met one of our tutors, Margo, who's actually a former, she's a former student. She graduated and then she came back to tutor students. And um, Margo works at the airport and she meets some of the most interesting people. But she and Courtney had a conversation. She realized, they realized that they had the GED, GED in common. And so she introduced Courtney to SEEDS. Courtney does marathons all over the world. She runs with tigers and lions and all kinds of things like that. And she raises money for seeds and she does like little things. So she, she, she's been our graduation speaker, but she likes to come in and talk to the students and just kind of encourage them on their journeys because she's walked that road before. So on Tuesday in June at 5.30, um, Courtney logs in and the login link is here and there's a little video about her. She just she's just written a book. So she to basically read a little bit from one of her books and then ask questions that students might have. And she's just really, really interesting and engaging. And her stories are unbelievable. Um, I think the first time I met her, I thought this none of this stuff can be true. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, so if you click video lessons, then you'll see the links for the video lessons and the table sessions so if you click table sessions they're scheduled these are the ones that are more social the repli replicate our classroom there's a schedule for them and then the link to access them is here and then for the video lessons you'll see that they're all planned so for example on monday there's a nine o'clock one on writing equations and slope intercept form there's a 10 o'clock one on geology there's a one o'clock on long division etc and then this last link here is the recorded lesson. So you, the students just click on whatever topic they're interested in, and then, <laughs> excuse me, they can see the videos. Um, they're all YouTube videos, so the students can see them from their phones for all of the lessons that we've done since we've closed. So better ways to multiply, inequalities, math formulas made simple. There are just tons and tons of videos for every subject area. And we also have, um, what we call job club on Wednesdays. We have two, two HR staff members from, uh, from an airline who come on and they facilitate a job club for our students. So they do a, a quick lesson on one aspect of employment searches and then they answer any questions that students might have. Um, and they, they do that for free, just out of the kindness of their hearts. So we have a lot of different things that we offer students even though we're closed. Um, so really quickly, um, are you familiar at all, um, Mia, with Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs? Uh, yeah, I, I've seen it for sure. Okay, so yeah. we, we talk about, um, Lindsay, are you from the last tutor training? Yes, you've definitely seen yeah. it before. Okay, have you, have you encountered this in your coursework at all? 
Uh, yeah, I feel like I've learned this in um, so I took college classes. I actually have an associates now as well as my high school diploma. Um, I've I've learned this in uh, my psychology class, I think. Yes. Okay, Lindsay, you too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, because I'm recording this, I'm just going to explain really quickly then what it is. So basically, Abraham Maslow was a psychologist. And after, through his studies of human behavior, he came up with this hierarchy to basically say that certain needs of ours trump other needs. Certain needs of ours have to be filled um, before we can focus on other needs. And so one of the, the very most basic needs are physiological needs, which is breathing, food, water, sleep, and clothing. We need those things just for our survival. If we don't have those things, it's very hard to focus on any other needs that we have. And that typically we tend to focus our resources, our, our time, our money, our energy on meeting the most basic needs first. And then once those most basic needs are met, then we have the resources to focus on those, those other needs. Um, I teach a financial literacy workshop for um, men who are in recovery. And I talk about this in that, in that workshop because a lot of them, um, are told not to not to jump into relationships while they're working on their recovery, but they don't really know why. So when we talk about the fact that when you're focusing on your your most basic needs, that love and belonging need is is higher up. That that they have a better understanding that you know I probably should be using my resources on getting well before I start worrying about the demands of maintaining a relationship, right? So mm -hmm. we talk about this in our training because a lot of times people feel like, well, basic education, that's got to be a, a level one need. But, but high school equivalency, which is what that HSD stands for, high school equivalency or GED, it's actually a self-actualizing need for someone who is trying to figure out how to keep a roof over their heads or how to not, how to avoid eviction or how to get enough food. So even though um, we have a lot of students. We typically serve around 1,100 students a year. Even though we have a lot of students, at one time, we may not be serving all 1,100 of those students because often they have to take time out to focus on some of their other needs. We think it's incredible that a lot of them e are able to focus on their high school equivalency goals with everything else that they have going on, which is part of the reason why our program is very open. Um, I had a student email me today and say, hey, I haven't checked in with a tutor for two weeks. Does that, can I continue? Or are you guys done with me? And it's like, no, we don't, we don't kick students out after, you know, we <laughs> understand life happens to us and we understand that life happens to you. We don't make them feel bad if they've missed or if they've been gone for a while. We're so happy to see them come back. We try to always be open and welcoming because we know that our students have a lot of challenges, um, as do we. Um, and we don't want them to feel like, you know, we don't want, want that emotion to be a barrier to them getting, uh, completing their goals. So we, we try to share that. Um, as far as our instruction, we try to focus our instruction on, um, we try to focus our instruction on uh, assessment, intervention, and, mon and, and monitoring. Like we really want to understand what is the root cause of a student struggling, because once we know why they're struggling, then we know how to help them. We know how to intervene in an appropriate way, and then we monitor their progress as they go along. So this is the learning path that our students follow for the most part. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, good morning. I see someone else joined us. Are you a tutor or are you a student? Can you unmute yourself? Let me see. Okay. Is it Stephanie? Stephanie, Hi, yeah. are you here? Are you <laughs> yeah. a tutor? Uh, yes, new volunteer. Okay, okay, perfect. All right, well, welcome. Um, you've missed a thank little you. bit of it, but I, I can do a recap for you really quickly at the end, okay? Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so, and then if you all have questions, just unmute yourself at any time, okay? Excuse me. So this is the learning path. I'm sorry. This is the learning path that our students follow at Seeds of Literacy. So first, when they come into our program, typically they take what's called the test of adult basic education, or we call it the TAPE test. Um, that test is a standardized test, and it basically allows us to, um, to figure out where students are academically. And it gives us a scale score, but we use that scale score to, to give us a bit of a grade equivalent. So it tells us where we can start them in our curriculum. If a student tests at maybe the high school level, then they follow the path on the left side, the light green. 
So they're, if they're at the high school equivalency prep level, you'll see HSC used a lot in our, our materials. HSC stands for high school equivalency. We used to just use GED generally, but GED um, trademarked, GED test service trademarked GED. So you can get sued for using that. So people just avoid saying GED. So we say high school equivalency because there are actually three tests that students can take to get a high school equivalency diploma in Ohio. Um, the GED is most popular, but the task and high set are also available in this state. And we typically encourage students to go for the task and high set if they really, really struggle with the computer because the GED is only available by computer, um, but the task and high set students can take a paper pencil test if they want. So if a student is at that high school equivalency level, which is like ninth grade or above, and we actually try not to use grades when we're talking to students because it, it can be very offensive. They don't necessarily understand it the same way that we do, and they get really upset, um, um, as I think any of us would if someone says, oh, well, you know, you're at the ninth grade level, when really individually they're not at that level. So we try to avoid that, but it kind of, we use it as kind of a guide for us. So if a student's at that level, um, where they're really preparing for the high school equivalency content, then they focus on their HSC literacy and they focus on digital literacy and workforce development through our partnership with the Will Industries. Um, if they are below, if they're at that eighth grade level or below, then they focus on their high school equivalency prep, but they also focus on reading intervention with their high school equivalency literacy studies. So with that reading intervention, what we do is we do a fluency assessment with our students first. A fluency assessment just looks at the speed, accuracy, and expression of a student reading. So if a student reads a passage and there's lots of expression and they stop at the period, and then their voices go up when they're asking a question, then we know that that student is a fluent reader. If a student is a fluent reader, then we know that they're most likely comprehending what it is that they're reading. If a student is not a fluent reader, if they read one word, if they read really, really slowly, then we know that they're probably spending so much of their working memory on trying to understand the words that are that, that are on the page that they don't have enough working memory left to actually comprehend what it is that they're reading. So that helps us to figure out if a student is fluent, then we don't need to do deep reading intervention for them. But if a student is not a fluent reader, then we want to dig deep, deeper and figure out why they're not fluent. Sometimes it's because they don't have phonics skills. Sometimes it's just because they don't know how to break down words that they don't know. Um, sometimes they just need to practice reading more fluently. So we, we really try to figure out what exactly is going on with the student and really help them um, improve their reading. We do a training for tutors to learn how to do the reading interventions and the reading assessments. Um, we have a fluency assessment training. We do a phonics assessment training uh, because we want tutors to be able to help students who are really, really low. Um, most adult literacy programs will not accept a student who's reading below a fourth grade level. Um, a lot of programs will say, oh, we accept everybody, but they'll accept them, but they just don't have anyone who knows how to help them. So eventually those students just drop out. As seeds, we catch everybody. Um, the only students that we won't take are students who have like behavioral issues because we don't want our tutors to have to manage behavior. So uh, next. We try to focus on equity versus equality here at SEED. So to demonstrate this, equality is on the left. Giving each student a box is equality, giving them all the same thing. But you notice the outcomes are not the same, right? So not everybody can see this match because they got equal. At SEED, we prefer equity. So we try to give students what they need to get to their outcome. Um, we try to also, we spend a lot of time talking about uh, the causes of literacy because we understand that the, our response to social problems is often dependent on where we locate the problem. So if we locate the problem in the individual, well, you shouldn't have gotten pregnant or you shouldn't have been on drugs or you shouldn't have whatever. If we locate the problem in the individual, then we feel like there's nothing really for us to do. It's up to them to fix it. But if we realize that the problem is a societal problem, that it's a systemic problem, that it's not an individual's choice to be unable to read in their 30s, then we feel we take more ownership and our response is to kind of roll up our sleeves and figure out how we can help. Um, we do try to emphasize the fact that what we say matters. Um, we included this first bullet, students know when you don't believe in them. Um, and I think that that 
I don't think sometimes people understand that. We have a tutor now who we're kind of working with because she'll say things like, I mean, she's never going to get this GED, is she? I mean, do you really think she's going to ever complete this? So if you have that attitude with the students, if that's what you believe at your core, your actions in the classroom with them are going to reflect that. If you think a student's not going to get it, you're not likely to persist if they get to a point where they're struggling. You're more likely to throw in the towel and feel like, well, maybe, maybe we can work on something else. And what that communicates to the student is, I must be too stupid to get this because she doesn't want to continue with me. So we try to be really careful and try to get tutors to understand that our students actually do have, they're very intelligent. I mean, if you think about, think about not being able to read at the level that you're able to read or being able to compute and write at the able that you're able to compute and write, think about how, what in your life would be different if you didn't have those skills, right? So our students are, their parents, their caregivers, their workers, their business owners, they're, they're doing all kinds of incredible things without these skills that you have to be intelligent to do that. And a lot of them have, have navigated this life without people realizing that they don't know how to read. So you have to have crazy coping skills to be able to do that as well. So um, sometimes you may say something and you may mean it one way and a student can receive it in a completely different way. Um, one really, one example that stands out for me is um, we had a tutor who used to come straight from work. And so she'd be dressed up all the time. And one week she came and she wasn't working. So she just came in like regular clothes. And she, one of our staff members looked at her and said, oh, you know, I almost didn't recognize you. And she goes, well, why? I mean, I'm bummy, but I'm still a tutor. And she was mortified to realize that the students were thinking, well, is she saying that we're all bummy? Is that what she's saying? And it wasn't what she meant at all, but it, it, it's actually what it is that she said. <laughs> and so the students interpreted it that way. Um, one thing that sometimes tutors will say to try to encourage students is they'll say, oh, this is easy. But when you say that and then the student struggles with it, then that communicates to them that there must be something wrong with them. Um, sometimes if a student says if they're doing math and let's say they carry, but they forget to add that number in as they're multiplying, um, it, we might say something like, oh, it's just a little silly mistake. But it feels for them like, like you're not saying the mistake is silly, like you're saying they are. So they just you just have to be very careful. Uh, this next one is one I am totally guilty of. I have a friend who I was helping with math a couple of years ago who will not let me live it down. But I was trying to get her to, I was trying to work with her on um, triangle applications. And so I was talking to her and I said, well, we know that, uh, you know, we know that a, a, a right triangle is 90 degrees. And she was like, no, Carmen, you know that a right triangle is 90 degrees, right? So I have to stop myself because it's, it's just very easy for to do any of these. But being careful to say, well, haven't you ever heard of whatever? Well, you know, the student may have, may not have heard of it. Maybe her school didn't get to it, or maybe she wasn't in classes where they challenged her at that level. So just kind of being really careful about how we say things to students. So getting to the test, the high school equivalency tests, again, there are three in Ohio, the TASC, T-A-S-C, the HISET, H-I-S-E-T, and the GED. They all cover the same things, language arts, which is reading and writing, math, science, and social studies. Now, one thing I will say is that the language arts, students know word has gotten around that you can pass the language arts section without getting any points on the essay, and that it's nearly impossible to get points on the essay. So a lot of our students don't wanna work on writing in class, so you'll find that, that they're a little bit resistant to that. We're actually, developing a writing class, uh, we're developing a transitions program to help students transition into post-secondary. Um, and there's a class that is specific to writing, mainly because we know a lot of our students don't focus on writing and we don't, we want them to be prepared for college level writing and for writing research papers and things like that before they go. So, but you'll notice that in class, a lot of our students don't wanna focus on that. Uh, we spend a, a huge focus on reading because it is the foundation for everything. Um, most adult literacy programs focus only on vocabulary and comprehension. We focus on phonemic awareness, phonics, and fluency. Phonemic awareness is knowing the letters um, or our, our graphemes, the letters that we use, the 26 letters of our alphabet, and the sounds that they represent. So phonemic awareness is knowing that a B is B and P is P, and that um, C can be C or K. So if a student has that, then they have the foundation for phonics. And phonics is learning the rules for combining our sounds together in the English language. So knowing that an F can be an F sound can be made by a PH as in phone or by an LF as in calf, right? So 
so phonics is kind of understanding those rules of how to blend things together. So once a student has that phonics awareness, then they're able to become a more fluent reader because they know what to do when they get to a word that they don't know. Um, vocabulary is really important because if you don't understand vocabulary words, it makes it very difficult to comprehend. And I'm gonna give you a quick example of that right now. If you can all just read this paragraph to yourselves on your screen and then tell me what is the stiff shop? Question number three on the right. You're muted, um, Mia. Is it B to smat the cots? It is B to smat the cots. And now since you're unmuted, what is a finiquig? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, perfect. So thank you for letting me uh, use you and make an example out of you. I appreciate you being a support about that. So basically, um, we use this to show that you, if you have the phonics skills, you probably read through this with no problem, right? So you're probably, you probably read it fluently. You didn't struggle with the phonics of it, but because the vocabulary is not as foreign to you, it's like, well, I don't really know. Like, and I can even answer questions about it and still not yeah. comprehend it. So the, the goal of this exercise is to show that you definitely want to um, understand the vocabulary, that that's, that that's very important. So I'll show you the translation and you can see that, um, you can see that. Yeah, right? So now it's like, oh, of course I get it. I totally understand it now because that vocabulary issue has been removed, right? Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry I logged in. Okay. Late. Are you a student or are you training, a volunteer trainee? A volunteer trainee. Okay. So I'm going to loop back around to some of the beginning stuff when this is over, but let me get the two who were here uh through so just kind of bear with us okay what's your name jonita jonita okay perfect okay um all right so we use this exercise just to kind of demonstrate to tutors that you really do want to have you really want to take the time to help students understand the vocabulary if you really want them to understand the concepts and i think that's even imp really important in math as well so really quickly um i can send you um i can send you these tips but I think some of, I'm just gonna highlight some of the most important ones really right now. The first is that every student's gonna learn differently. So you just have to be patient. Um, some of our students, our students are anywhere from 18 to 80 years old. Some of them are, are refugees. They've never had any formal schooling. So this is their first experience with this. A lot of students may not have ever had phonics before. Um, some of our students, some of our tutors haven't had phonics before. So just be patient. Um, understand that a lot of our students come to us and they're very embarrassed that they're in this program because they feel like this is something that they should have done. And we just say, you know, but you made a decision today. You're making steps today. And we try to honor their courage for being there. Um, I try to focus on mastery, not completion. I try to focus on making sure the students understand something. So say, for example, if they're doing a math packet and they're working on multiplication facts, it'll their packets will look like this. If they're working on this packet, I don't care so much that they complete every row. If they can tell me what they're doing and they understand it well enough, it doesn't matter to me if they don't complete every single problem. A lot of times I'll tell students not to complete every problem because sometimes you'll be working with a student on fractions and then you'll get them through divisions and ratios, proportions, and percents, and then they'll forget that other stuff. So a lot of times I'll tell students not to complete everything so that they have some problems to practice when they're at home. Um, Another thing is uh, model procedure. Sometimes it helps students for, for, it's helpful for the student for you to talk about what it is that you do. So for example, 
Um, I'm going to ask Mia since Mia's not muted and since she's been a good sport already. Mia, if you're reading a paragraph, say for one of your school books, and you don't understand what it is, what do you do when you don't understand a paragraph? Um, I'd probably try to like look up words that I don't understand, maybe ask my professor or uh, maybe like a friend in class. Mm -hmm. Do you ever reread a paragraph if you don't get it the first time? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so our students don't know that we do that. They think that we just read everything and we <laughs> get it and it's not a problem, right? So if you share with them the things that you do, it can be very helpful. So uh, sometimes I'll ask a student if, they're, if they're, they've read one or two sentences, I'll say, well, what is this? What do those first two sentences tell you? And if they say, oh, it, it means, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'll say, okay, well, write that down in the margin. If, it's, if you're reading two paragraphs about Americans eating and, and you say, you know, Americans have lots of food choices, but we choose poorly. Um, in two sentences, that might be a lot, but if, if the student writes, Americans have variety, we choose poorly, they don't have to read that whole entire sentence again to have an idea of what that paragraph is about. So, and I'll show students that I do that in my own work. Every book that I have that I teach my CSU students, every single book I have has all kinds of notes in the margins because I don't have time to read those books over every single semester, but I want to remember what were the salient points, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so modeling the things that you do and teaching them how you think about things and showing them how you approach a problem. And I would say too, one of the best things to do when you're working with a student is to start off by saying, okay, uh, Chanita, you're working on fractions today. Tell me what you understand about fractions. What do you already know? because our students are smart and maybe they do remember some things about fractions or maybe they work with another tutor. If you start out by asking them what they already know, you don't, you're not assuming that they don't know something, which can be offensive, right? But also you get an idea of their understanding of it. So if I say, oh, Janitha, so what is, or say, if say Janitha's tutoring me and she says, Carmen, what, what, what are fractions? If I say, you know, I don't know, I don't really understand. Then she knows I need to start with making sure she gets what a fraction actually is before I get her to start trying to add or subtract or multiply or divide them. So I like to start off, start off working with the student by saying, okay, so what are you working on? Tell me what you know about it already. Or how can I help you? Where, where do you want to start? Like, let them do it. They're adults. A lot of times we feel like because we're tutoring them, people still kind of approach it as like when a teacher and a younger student. But sometimes you'll be tutoring someone who's twice your age. That happens. So ask them. Uh, so those are one of the general tips. With math, I think the math vocabulary is so, so important. People don't often take the time to define vocabulary. And let me tell you, we had a student who was doing um, division and did not have any idea what division meant, like no clue what it meant. And so we asked him, you know, how many grandkids do you have? And he's like, well, I have 11. I'm like, well, how much are you planning to spend for Christmas? Well, I'm going to spend $450. Well, how do you make sure that each kid gets the even amount so that you're fair? You know, oh, that's what division is. Yes, that's what division is. Um, he also didn't know, you know, he'd been doing division problems, but he didn't know that the little symbol, the little dot, dot, slat, he didn't know that that meant to divide. And that's something that it's easy to take for granted, but we want to make sure students understand the vocabulary, meaning the terms and the symbols in math. Um, sometimes with math, one strategy we use is modeling, I do, you do, I do, where I may do a problem so that the student can see, you know, what I'm doing. And then I give them an opportunity to do the next problem and I kind of talk them through it. And then I, I might show them again, you know. So um, actually in the way that I do it is I'll talk through it as I do it, and then I'll do it again, and I'll leave some gaps for them to tell me what to do. So what do I do next? Oh yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this number down, and then I'm gonna subtract, and then you know that. So and so I'll I'll do everything, and I'll talk through it. The second time I'll do it, everything, and I'll talk through it. But I'll ask the student for support. The next time I'll ask the student to work through the problem, and I'll talk them through it, and then the student should be able to work on it on their own. Some students it may take three or four different demonstrations. Some students may get it after one. Some of them might interrupt you and say, oh, oh no, I remember, and, and kind of run with it. But sometimes that modeling is really important. The other thing is math is a very abstract concept, and it's very important to focus to make it concrete for students. So find a way to make it relevant for them. So for example, with the, with the gentleman in division, once he realized that taking a pot of money that he's familiar with and dividing it between his 11 grandchildren, and he understand the idea of fairness, he got it. 
Um, the same gentleman, we were trying to show him how to use our multiplication tables to practice division. So our multiplication tables list, one times two is two, two times two is four, three times two is six, four times two is eight. So we're trying to show him how to use that as to practice as uh, division as well. Because if one times two is two, then two divided by two is one, right? So we're trying to get him to understand that. And he was really struggling with the idea of it. And so we finally, we finally asked him, what happens if you mix water and dirt together? And he goes, if you mix water and dirt, you're going to get mud. And I said, well, what happens if you have the mud and you take out the water? Well, then you're just going to have dirt. Well, in the same way, if you have two times two, you get six. If you take, if you have six and you divide it by three, you're going to get two. And he was like, oh, why didn't somebody say that to me a long time ago? So try to think of a way that connects to real life to help them understand the math. It makes it so much easier for both of you. <laughs> um, so after this session is over, um, I'm going to ask you to please send an email to my email address here. Um, once you send that email to me, I'm going to send you a registration survey so you'll be able to sign up um, as a tutor. Um, and then our team will add you to our contact list. You'll be able to get mailings and things like that. I would suggest um, that you observe a session. I'm going to send you an invitation. On Thursdays, our, tu our site coordinator, Kara, sent, does a a tutor check-in on Thursdays at 4:45, and it's just everybody getting on a go-to-meeting call like this and she just says hey guys how was the week what's going on I'm going to send you an invitation to the one this week because it might be helpful for you to log on and hear what other tutors are saying about their experiences with teletutoring and things like that um, at the moment we're not asking for new teletutors because we don't want to have you sign up and then have you just sitting on a phone line with not enough students when we get more students who are interested in it we'll add more slots Right now, we're asking for folks who are willing to do video tutoring um, or to do act the actual live lessons. And <laughs> I will say this, I know that in the future, we'll also be asking for some tutors to support us in terms of reception, um, meaning that when we do start going back on site and bringing students in for their reassessments and things like and re-registration, we may ask some tutors if they'd be willing to cover our registration table, which is basically like, answering the phone so that new students know how to reach us and get the orientation. Um, we do have our reception areas are working behind plexiglass shields or windows so you'll, you're not like out in the open. But I know that that's another opportunity that's coming up. We probably won't have in-class opportunities for tutors until September or later depending on what happens with the virus. So um, that's really kind of everything. Um, I think this is my last slide. You have a question, Mia? Yeah, uh, for uh -huh. the video lessons, you said it's basically like the tutor comes up with a lesson that they want to teach. Mm -hmm. Is that um, is there like a list of lessons that you guys need, or do we like look what's not under the video tabs and like come up with something? That's a great question. Um, so Chris Chris Richards is the site coordinator. He's our West Side site coordinator, and he's the one who's kind of managing the video lessons and table sessions right now. <laughs> And so basically what he'll do is he sends out a call every thir every every Thursday, I think. He sends out an email to all the tutors and he says, hey, I'm looking for people to do video lessons. What what lessons are you willing to offer? And if you just say to him, you know, like, uh, here, here are a couple co topics that I'd like to teach and he'll let you know, like, and honestly, we've had people do, like, I did one, you know, I did a lesson on this and someone else did that same, did a similar lesson because there's so many different ways to cover it. It's really okay. Um, so basically, you'll communicate with Chris about what lessons you're teaching, and he'll let you know, you know, if he wants you to tweak it or focus on a different area or what, what have you. And then we do su provide support. So if you need like a training on how to how to do go to meeting, now we do have staff in the live session, so there's someone who can support you in that. So you, if something's happening with, you know, someone's like, oh, I'm having a hard time getting on, you don't have to worry about that. We'll handle that. You could just focus on teaching your lesson. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so good, good question. Any other questions? I want to let I want to let Mia and um, Lindsay go, and then I'll just kind of loop back around to the beginning so I can catch the other two up. Is that good? I think we're good. Okay, so Mia, you got this. Everybody got this email address because I'm going to leave this screen, and I don't want you all to be at a loss for where to send this email. Um, so it's C A R M I N E 
S T E W A R T at S E E D S O F L I T E R A C Y dot org. So it's Carmen, it looks like Carmine, but it should be Carmine Stewart at seeds of literacy dot org. Okay. So just email you that like, hey, we attended the session or something. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And then I'll have your I'll have your email addresses and I'll send you the registration, the link to our volunteer application, and I'll send you the invitation to Kara's um, session later on in the week. Um, and, and that's something that if you just if you just want to log in and see what other tutors are thinking. One other thing I would encourage you to do is to go to our website to one of the plan lessons or one of the one of the teletutor sessions and call in and just listen to tutor 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 student interaction and see how that goes. I mean, these are just if you want to view one of the video lessons first and see if like, oh yeah, I can definitely do that. Feel free to our our the resources on our website are available for everybody. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? That's a lot faster than the last one, right, Lindsay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you, Lindsay, and thank you, Mia, for joining me today. Um, I look forward to your email, Mia, and you can look forward to an email from me shortly after the training. Sounds good. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. So, and... And let's see. Miss Ali. Uh, I'm going to stop this recording. Um,